All right, YouTube, it's time for the occult, video 99, getting up towards 100 videos in this series on green witchery, natural magic, hedge wicca, things like that. Uh, by the way, I'm getting over like a 24-hour cold. My allergies really acted up the other day. That's why I took it easy today as far as the videos went, and I had to do a lot of writing and editing. There's some big projects that are just uh, finishing up, so... I need to focus on them for the next day or two. Don't worry, there'll be more videos in the next couple of days, obviously. Uh, my thoughts on, like, green witchery, that is, like, natural magic, feeling like natural forces, it really ties in with a lot of ancient spiritual traditions that are perhaps thought of by the more academic side of the occult as more, uh, you know, intrinsically authentic. You'd think of cultus arborum, actually. That's the f sort of the first thing you'd think of. Uh, the practice of gardening, or caring for nature, being like kind to animals, kind to plants, cultivating them, caring for them. Uh, these things are should not be seen. Number one, I think a lot of people think of them as slightly feminine. And I've never thought that at all. Honestly, uh, I, I think it's sort of a you know, both genders participate in such a thing. You look at ancient Persia, you know, one of the uh, rather early empires, only, like, the, the kingly dudes, the nobility, male nobility, were even, even really had gardens. It was not only a status symbol, because, you know, it's fairly dry there, you have to irrigate it, uh, but it was considered very close to being godly, in, in a literal sense, being like a god. You're literally controlling the entire life cycle of some of these beings, uh, you know, domesticating animals early on was, you know, extremely beneficial for mankind. You had the dogs to help you hunt, and they also helped clean up, like, refuse that you were lying around. You know, all the gristly parts of the meat, they'd chomp down on it. You know, the humans couldn't really make use of it. The cats entered in very quickly thereafter and started going after the rodents, uh, and so they were good companions and also perhaps helping to hunt small game. Then you have like cattle and things like that, of course, milk and, and cheese and, and so forth, and just meat in general, or chickens, something like that. Uh, cultivating plants, breeding them, uh, you have to realize virtually all aspects of civilized magical system, uh, that is vir virtually all aspects of the occult as we would practice it, rely upon man conquering nature in that manner. Now, I don't say exploit, and therein lies a big difference. Uh, for instance, I'm not a vegetarian, uh, fully. Uh, I prefer vegetarian entrees for the most part. I think they're tastier, generally speaking. But I'm not a dedicated vegetarian. I do, however, find great concern with the concept of like factory farming and things of that nature. I think it's regrettable that it exists. I don't think that it's necessary that it exists. I think a lot of people eat far, far too much flesh in their diet. They're putting their health at risk, potentially, by doing so, especially the processed meats. And I think it's out of touch with nature. I think that showing compassion towards animals is innate. I don't think it has anything to do with being weak or a crybaby. Uh, I think, honestly, it's the natural mode of humanity, especially when you're talking about some cute, fluffy animal. It's, it's perhaps, psychologically, it affects us differently. You could almost consider, like, cats or puppies or something like that as almost, like, parasitic upon the human race, at least as we care for them now. In the olden days, it was, oh, well, you know, we've got these cats in the cave. They eat all the mice and little pieces of gristle, and we don't have a problem with them because they keep the rodents out, and we notice we don't get sick as much, and, you know, we don't have to deal with mice scurrying over our beards when we're asleep and stuff like that or fucking crawling up into our assholes to eat our intestines. Now, nowadays, of course, most people, if they have, like, cats or dogs, they don't just throw them, like, the bo the bones and the gristle. They give them, like, pet food and stuff like that. You think of barn cats are perhaps the closest thing we've got uh, to sort of that authentic domestication that's actually there, and they tend to breed out of control uh, very easily. You get feral populations. This is, by the way, fairly natural. Better to have a population of feral cats in your neighborhood than a population, a large population of rodents, I would like to think. Uh, people probably shouldn't be leaving them large amounts of food. That'll just keep them breeding. It's almost a microcosm of the welfare state, but I'm getting a little bit off of track here. Uh, the concept of natural magic is there is a spiritual, innate, energetic force within life. Uh, you'd look at animism or something. Green, like hedge wicca or green witchcraft, takes it a little bit differently. It's a veneration 
in a more strictly spiritual sense than simply denoting that there's an energy there, I suppose. And it fits in with the other tenets of Wicca, you know, don't do harm and the laws of, of karma and so forth, getting back, you know, if you put out negativity, you get it several times back onto yourself, either like three or five or ten times or whatever. I guess it depends on who you ask. I'm not a believer in karma, but I am a believer in pragmatism, and that's why I suggest <clears throat> humans should be kind to animals, uh, they shouldn't, you know, rant, they shouldn't certainly abuse them. Uh, they shouldn't mistreat them. They they shouldn't be just seen as a food source, including animals we typically use for food. Uh, they should have the right to be uh, to live a life of dignity. That's my strong belief. Uh, I I believe in these things. It's an it's an ethics question for me. As far as plants go, yeah, I think everyone should at least know how to cultivate plants. Some people they have a brown thumb. You know, they'll take the they put a bean in a pile of compost and even that wilts and dies and i can understand that there are some people that just can't get the knack for it i have to keep in mind my own bias here because i have a green thumb uh, so you know i can just take a plant and rip it out of the ground put it somewhere else water it in and it'll survive you know 99 percent of the time a lot of people have difficulty doing that sort of thing strangely enough i transplanted carrots once and they actually survived and that's uh, fairly difficult to do at times. You know, they have one long taproot, and if you damage it at all, you're kind of screwed. You end up with a stunted little carrot, or it dies and withers or something like that. Uh, but I have a connection to nature. In fact, I'd say it's stronger than my connection to the average human. Uh, I get along with animals almost uniformly, including like the creepy crawly animals, like spiders don't bother me, or snakes, or something like that. Uh, you know, I used to be kind of afraid of dogs, because when I was a little kid... I got jumped on by a very large dog, and I thought it was trying to attack me, so I was, like, terrified. And for a while there, I was scared of him, but then I became, like, six foot two, and I quickly realized, unless it's, like, an Irish wolfhound, it tends to be quite a bit smaller than I am. So I sort of grew out of that fear. And as for cats, I see a cat in the, in the street or something, it's going to get petted, or it's at least going to get beckoned over to get petted, and it's usually going to come over, uh, because I like cats. Sort of a spirit animal thing, I suppose you could say. But I happen to agree with natural magic in an ethical sense and in a spiritual sense and an occult sense. Uh, as far as the occult is concerned, think of uh, the occult without, uh, without plants, for example. Well, there goes most of your incense sources. There goes the wood that you need for your wand. There goes the wood or charcoal for your ceremonial fire. There go the cotton fibers or whatever for your, your robe or, and so forth. Wool would be important, you know, you know, uh, wool and parchment made of animal skin. Animal products are also used, the, the teeth of a dog, the skull of a bat sort of stuff. Uh, it's intrinsic to most authentic paths within magic. You'd be hard-pressed to find that many grimoires, for example, that don't somewhere mention a product that comes directly, not just indirectly, from an animal or a plant source. In some of them, it's quite profuse. You look at the Petite Albert or the Greater Key of Solomon, it's you know the blood of a bat and the boiled skull of a cat sort of stuff. Uh, and if you don't have that population there, if it hasn't been cultivated, whether animal or plant, now, then it's not there. Well, boo-hoo for you. Drugs. Drugs. All sorts of medicines. Not just the mind-altering ones. Most of these materials are found in nature. Um, you would even think they're, they're hallucinatory substances that come from animals. You'd think of Bufo alvarius, of uh, the toad. Uh, I can't remember the actual, uh, the something river toad, if I remember correctly. It's like this big, ugly toad, and you, like, milk the venom out of it, and it has 5-MeO-DMT in it, and so forth. It's not considered as as good as, you know, actual DMT, but, you know, you can use it in a ritual format, I suppose. You know, disclaimer, I'm not telling you that's safe or legal, of course. <laughs> I hate throwing that out. But, yeah, a green witchcraft in a general sense, uh, as, uh, as uh, connected with natural magic, I think, is a very good thing. You'd be hard-pressed to find as well a culture, I think, that doesn't have the trappings of this in its spiritual system, even within Christianity. What's Jesus called? The Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. What's Satan? Oh, a roaring lion. <laughs> you get all of these different things. Uh, the Golden Calf. 
you know, the story of that one retard there who changed the genetic composition of his goats by putting little striped rods in their drinking water and stuff. I mean, it's tale after tale, or Balaam's donkey, or something like that. You look at Islam, you're getting the same thing. You look at, like, Judaism, you're getting the same thing. Lots of references to animals and plants. Plants especially. Entire lists of, like, sacred herbs and scents from herbs and so forth. Uh, books and books from antiquity up through, you know, the pre-modern era about different things to cook with, about flavors, about the spiritual usages, uh, usages of these things. Uh, it's interconnected. If you don't take care of nature, you don't have any of these things. I don't think we need to be polluting the world, overpopulating it. Yes, I would say that's a problem. Um, you know, abusing animals, ripping up all of nature. There should be wild spaces for people to go. I think the world's already a few billion past its prime, but that's just me. I think we could comfortably, uh, you know, I don't know, encourage people to use condoms more, solve this problem a little bit, you know, something like that, or dictate that people, you know, have to have a certain amount of land so you can only have a certain amount of people in your fucking country. That'd probably be the way to go, uh, honestly. Setting land aside doesn't do enough, apparently. It'd be a good thing to do. Uh, if you want to preserve nature, anyway. If you want to preserve the occult path, you have to have nature. Uh, I've pointed out in Fruits of Eden that there is a stark difference between the use of magic, the types of ceremonialism involved between an urban population and a rural pastoral population. The type of magic, the ethics behind it can be different. The tradition certainly is almost invariably going to be different. It's really only the internet that allows the urbanite to engage in rural magic. It's really only the internet that allows a rural person to engage in urban styles of magic. Uh, the two are not the same. There are big differences between the two. There is some overlap, but generally speaking, they're different. And without nature, both of them fall apart. And the person who's rural, their, their nature is around them. The urbanite ends up having to literally, like, they use an e-store, they have to take a trip out to the countryside or talk to their Wiccan friend from outside of the suburbs in order to get sort of the materials that they may need. They need them to be produced for them uh, by other human beings who do live in a rural setting. It's actually very, very funny. Uh, you go to an urban setting, you're also not going to see much, you know, smithing of ceremonial blades or the creation of, you know, this type of robe that you need. No, you probably imported it from China or Korea or something. If you got it domestically, it probably didn't even come from within 500 miles of you. And so if we don't protect nature, then we don't have any of these things. And unfortunately, uh, the worst exploiters of nature can ruin it for everybody else, specifically because they tend to be gargantuan. Because for every person who's conscious of nature around them, uh, like, I tend my garden, I keep the property maintained, I like the trees, I don't just cut them down, I plant them as well. Uh, for everybody who's doing that, living that sort of lifestyle, who's in connection with nature, who's around nature, who cares for animals, unfortunately there's a person who neglects or abuses animals, eats meat constantly, and just, you know, they shovel down a whole cow every month or something like that, and who really, they, they just throw their trash everywhere, there's just a pile of shit, and they don't even really think about it. And a lot of these people, if they're urban, they don't really... They, what's nature to a New Yorker? It's Central Park. They don't know what a forest looks like. They look at Central Park, they think it's the woods or something like that. It's actually uh, very funny. Yeah, it's the woods with Wi-Fi. That's what they've got in New York City. I feel very sorry for those people. I've gone through big cities before. I can't stand them. I can't stand the noise. I can't stand the smell. I can't stand the constant hubbub of people milling around. It just uh, it annoys the shit out of me, honestly. It just uh, renders people as nothing more than, uh, you know, sort of background objects in your presence. There's no connection at all. And uh, there's certainly no connection with nature. Some piece of crabgrass growing in the dilapidated piece of pavement in an abandoned area of New York City is more like authentic nature than all of Central Park. And I think sometimes people forget that. People do need to get more in tune with nature. It would be a perfect world if everybody lived around it. It'd be a perfect world if the big cities were lined with strips of actual forest that were allowed to be forest, broken apart into sections of city, connected uh, in some way, maybe underground or whatever, with enormous swaths of nature between them. This would also take care of a lot of your pollution, heat islands, probably help with the crime rate, 
if you've ever played SimCity, you understand this. I'm just joking there. Uh, but no, it's a big problem in the world today. There's less and less nature to go around. Thankfully, in some parts of the world, <laughs> like where I was born, you know, there's like, what, a one in a million chance or something of me actually being born in this state, or one in a hundred thousand or something like that. Or maybe my numbers are completely wrong. I don't even care. Uh, but anyway... Up here, nature is everywhere. We're like 92% forest in this state, uh, and it's not much lower in New Hampshire, Maine, most of Massachusetts, part most of New York, really. More than half of New York is basically just a giant forest, too. I think sometimes people forget that. They think of the city, or maybe Albany. They think that that's what New York's about. You go to upstate New York, it's almost less there than there is here in Vermont. There's enormous space up there in the Catskills. It's basically unpopulated for about 100 miles in every direction. It's actually really, really funny. So, yes, yeah, so I encourage nature worship. I encourage nature veneration, the protection of nature and everything associated with it. Green witches, like hedge witches, I would get along with, like, a hedge wic uh, Wiccan more probably than uh, a neo-pagan that's closer to my path but lives in some big city somewhere because the way in which they think is going to be so drastically different. That's about all. Peace out.